I'm Jimmy Lewis with Dirt Bike Test, and today we're talking about KTM's 390 Adventure. So this is KTM's newest adventure bike. It's their smallest adventure bike, and it's not really designed for your average KTM rider. This is designed for newer riders, not the typical bike you see us test here at Dirt Bike Test. It actually comes with pretty round tires. They're the Continental TKC 70s, which are not really a knobby type tire. We did ride this bike in the beginning with that tire. Then we switched it over to something a little bit more aggressive, the Kenda Big Blocks, and We've been putting a lot of miles on it, and this is what we think about this bike. But I'll let you know that typically with dirt bike tests, we're thinking about like more aggressive bikes. We're thinking about um, kind of like upper end of performance. We do understand who this bike is designed for, and we tested it in that capacity. We had a lot of different people ride this bike, some very new riders, and we got a really well-rounded opinion in the changes department, this bike has no changes. That's because it's all brand new. But it is based off a couple other bikes in KTM's line. Most notably the Duke, which is like a naked street fighter type bike that's been around for a little while. And it's a little bit different than a lot of the other KTM's because this bike is actually built by a company called Baja. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly but it's also made in India. So you're gonna see some components that are probably not super top of the line. You know, the fasteners aren't the same quality and it's done like that so you can have a lower price tag. And this bike retails at $61.99, you know, plus the usual dealer fees and stuff. And that puts it right in the range of bikes like Honda Sierra 250L and you know, the Yamaha XTs and the Kawasaki KLRs that are even of lower displacement. So they've really worked on making this a price point bike, an affordable and easy entry level machine to get into. In the power department, well, it's a 372 cc double overhead cam single cylinder. Not a lot to talk about there, but there kind of is because what this bike does have that's actually pretty advanced is as fly-by-wire throttle control. That's the same as on the KTM's bigger adventure bikes. Um, it's what you're seeing on their basically factory road racing bikes and stuff. And this is where the future is going. And a lot of it is done for emissions. So this bike is very quiet. It really is a clean burning motorcycle. And when you start needing a high level of performance and clean burning, those two things don't usually go together too well. So they use fly by wire for that. But KTM has also done something else that's pretty ingenious is they've engineered the throttle response to be, I would call it, relatively tame and it's like anytime you turn the throttle you're not getting necessarily a one-to-one -one. like when your wrist turns don't expect those butterfly valves to turn exactly like your wrist it's usually a little bit less than what you expect but it sets the bike into a very torquey part of the power no matter what rpm you're at and this motor has a really long spread so power wise you know and even though they call it a 390 it's a 372 you might feel like oh that's enough or it's not enough there's plenty of power almost all the way through the range as long as you're looking at torque. So it pulls and it's, you can do big giant throttle openings even at low RPMs and you're not gonna get bursts or jerks which is great for a beginner rider, someone that's novice that may not have that high level throttle control. It's like whatever you do, it kind of gives you just enough to kind of push you forward. They also have MTC which is motorcycle traction control and you can turn it on or off and we typically liked it off. Again, we're a little bit more advanced and stuff, but it really does work. And it's not like an old spark cut throttle, um, what would they call it, rev cut before when you're traction control. It moves the butterfly valves and it probably moves them faster than you would if you lost throttle control on your own. So for a novice rider, they've got a really good setup. As we start putting advanced riders on it, they felt like there wasn't throttle response. And, but when you really paid attention to it, from about you know the lower RPMs, two to four or five thousand RPM, there's not much throttle response. But once you're up four, five, you know, five and a half, six, it starts coming alive. And if you start snapping the throttle at seven and eight thousand RPMs, you feel how peppy and perky this motor is. So there's power there. You just have to use RPM to get that snappy response. But in reality, when we're riding it like 
an adventure bike, you were never riding at that range. You're always in that four to 5,000, you know, 3,000, just kind of rolling the bike on. And you would start to get uncomfortable just rolling the throttle on quite a bit. And the bike would just chug and pull right through whatever you were trying to do. We did some pretty aggressive hill climbs, hill climbs that frankly, even our expert riders looked up and said, I don't know about that. And the bike would go up. And then we did some other stuff, riding in gravel, riding in sand, and it does okay. It's not the throttle response you'd expect out of a 350 EXC. It's kind of its own thing designed for what it's supposed to do, which is kind of adventure touring um, at a small scale. So power-wise, it actually does pretty good. You know, it's it gets up there in the R's if you really need it to. It's enough to make the bike go eh, comfortably 90 miles an hour if you needed to. But when you're going to go from that 60 to 70 or 60 to 80 to overtake, you know, a, a truck on the highway, something like that, it's not going to do it like a twin cylinder bike. It's just going to lumber along. But if you drop down a gear, maybe two, and really rev it up, it'll move the bike along. It goes freeway speeds. You're just not going to be in the fast lane on the freeway. You know, it'll get you there. That's not really what it's designed to do. But if you are cruising on a back road and stuff, it'll go plenty fast. If you're on dirt roads, it'll go almost as much as the tire handle. Um, you know, you can spin this thing up and get it, you know, get it revving and going. So it's pretty adequate. An expert rider is going to want more and a really good rider will feel how much potential there is in the motor. And I'm sure the aftermarket and maybe if we take this bike for a little bit longer, we'll find a way to squeeze a little bit more out of it. So inside the motor is a six speed transmission and it has a cable activated clutch and the six speeds are spaced pretty even. Uh, first gear might be a little bit taller than what a dirt bike guy is used to. Sixth gear is a little bit like an overdrive. It's really long, it lets the bike rev out and pull it when you need to. Um, and then the clutch, the pull, I would say the clutch pull is medium, but you really don't have to use it. You can almost just let it out. It's a slipper clutch, believe it or not. And so when you make downshifts, it's really easy to make the downshifts. Another thing that this bike has is quick shift, which is a kind of an advanced feature. And all you have to do is hit your foot on the shifter and the bike without using the clutch actually does a little quick rev cut and then bang, it goes. But I'll tell you something else interesting we found with this is we all of a sudden noticed that the bike had this strange cutout that we were feeling that was kind of awkward. And we weren't sure, it was like, it, we thought it was a certain RPM and then we noticed it wasn't a certain RPM. We thought it was a certain gear, it wasn't a certain gear. It was our foot touching the shifter. And the shifter was actually causing the rev cut that would allow you to shift, but we weren't trying to shift. It was just your foot bumping into the shifter. And when we start talking about the handling and ergonomics, we'll go a little bit more into the position of the brake and the shift pedal, which is a little bit different than what we're used to. But that was what our quote cutout was. Another thing that was interesting is this bike is supposed to, when you set the traction control and turn it off, it's supposed to stay off. And we found that sometimes when you started the bike up, the voltage of the bike would drop and it would cause it to reset the traction control, which is not a very good thing. Because if you don't want traction control on, you don't want traction control on. And so we we started experimenting with it, try to figure out what it was. It's that drop in voltage that causes causes it to rearm. KTM is aware of this problem. We are actually we are actually we actually found an additional wire that they put on here to help the grounding issue. And we're kind of thinking that there's a bigger battery on our bike than is standard, but that may show up. Um, is new. This is an early production bike, so some of these things could be changed by the time you see this or by the time they hit dealers, but that's one of the issues that we did complain about for sure. So for suspension, uh, KTM has done what they always do <laughs> with their adventure bikes. It's not soft and mushy like a regular one. They kind of went a little bit on the aggressive side. This is something that they've always done. They've always been a little bit more aggressive than most of the other brands and manufacturers. It continues on this. The components in this are something they're calling Apex, which they, they have the WP logo on them. And what I'm told is that actually the cartridges are built by WP and then shipped down for the forks, shipped down and assembled into the forks. I'm not sure how the shock is assembled or put together, but it has a nice billet part on it and it's adjustable spring pre preload with the ramp and then one adjuster that is rebound adjustment. And then the forks have individual compression and rebound adjusters on the top. So it's essentially an open cartridge fork and probably the same stuff 
or close to the same stuff that you're seeing in the current EXCs, at least the cartridge, so I'm told. So how does it work? You know, pretty good. So as far as its intended purpose, if you are, you know, the average size, uh, you know, which is smaller for this bike, someone that's interested in this size of a bike, I think you're gonna be pretty happy with this, uh, especially on-road, it's really good. Maybe a little bit on the stiff side. Then when you go to off-road, it has a, I'll call it an aggressive nature, which is where everything seems to be going. Um, and you can ride it fairly aggressive before it starts bottoming, which is the big thing that happens with a lot of adventure bikes when you start either putting weight on them or you know riding them through the bumps a little bit aggressive. So I, I think that for the, the average ride of the intended purpose, you're gonna be fine. You know, we started getting a little aggressive with it. We could start clanking, you know, the front or the rear, you know, bumping it into stuff. But we always realized, eh, we're probably riding it a little bit hard. Um, when you get into the kind of, you know, the washboards and stuff, it, it you, that's where your tire pressure is a little bit more critical, you know, in, in making the suspension work good. If you run really high tire pressure, this bike will feel kind of stiff. If you run, you know, low or moderate tire pressure, the tires do a lot of the uh, absorption that you may not find the suspension getting away with. We also played around with the adjusters and they do make the suspension stiffer but you're never going to get rid of that bottoming sensation. You can kind of tune the way the bike works in the mid stroke, you know, make it happy. But overall, I don't think in its category, in its class, you're going to find many complaints. It works as good as anything else out there that's entry level and in the, in the adventure category. And Oh, and by that, we mean we're pretty happy with it. So the handling department is where we tie the whole bike together. We talk about the chassis, how it works with the suspension, how it works with the engine. But there's one thing that we can't get away from on this bike is it feels like a street bike. It has, it has kind of this, you know, riding position that's kind of, well, if you sit down, it's going to be good. It's a really good sitting down motorcycle. And we initially we were going, ah, oh, the bars are too low and kind of blaming the bars a little bit. Um, but we started, the more we were riding, we we're like, hey, it's something to do with the foot pegs. And we started noticing the foot pegs are actually canted forward, which is really strange for a dirt bike. Most dirt bikes, our pegs are flat. These are kind of canted forward. And then we noticed where the brake pedal was, where the shifter was, they're down low. It's made so that you can operate them easily when you're sitting down. Once you go to standing up, it's like you're standing on a, on a, on a pole, not a peg, because you're only on the kind of the heel of the, of the foot peg. So that was causing us to not feel like we could stand all the way up. It made the bars feel a little bit low. Um, not to say that the bars couldn't come up a little bit in our world. Um, and then the whole chassis, it's, it's a tighter, it's a more compact chassis. It's not as roomy as a normal dirt bike. So a lot of this is done because this is a we'll call it a world bike. It's shared um, platforms with the 390 Duke and the, uh, the frame is actually almost identical to the, to the 390 Duke and the RC 390 because they're trying to make as many of these as inexpensively as possible. So we sort of struggle with that a little bit and almost everybody we put on it, aside from real new riders that were very comfortable and just wanted to sit down, they never complained. They didn't know any different. But any of our real dirt bike riders kind of got on it and said, how oh, this is awkward. In fact, we're going to look to try to find pegs that will actually, we don't really want to move them too much. We just want to level them back out. And then we want to move the shifter, move the brake pedal to get them into a more natural position for us. So that's kind of our, really our big complaint uh, with this bike when we're kind of coming from the dirt bike side of things. The other thing we'll complain about, and we really shouldn't, <laughs> because it, it's never intended to be ridden as aggressively as we did, is the tires. So it's coming with what we'll call a round tire. So we went and put Kenda Big Blocks, which is more of a knobby style or a block pattern style, and that way we could ride it in the, in the sand and the gravel. And not to say that the, the, the Continentals don't do good when everything's going right, but when you start slipping and sliding, you want some open blocks to kind of catch you. Those tires are mounted on a mag wheel. It's not a spoked wheel and we did bend the front rim in two spots and since it's a tubeless tire it started leaking and they weren't big hits but if you're not paying attention you start bumping into stuff you're going to bend the rims and it was one one dent was done with the stock tires the other one was done with our tires so it wasn't a tire thing and we were running them at the recommended pressures so 
It wasn't like we were running low tire pressure or anything like that. So the rims might be just a little bit on the soft side for more aggressive off-road riding, especially when you have a lot of rocks. When you get into the core part of the handling, like how does it handle, how does it turn, what is it stable? It's actually really stable. Uh, the bike has a certain amount of weight to it, 387 pounds on our scale, full of gas, because that's how you ride it. Um, it that weight adds some planted feel. In, once you're moving, it adds a certain amount of stability to the bike. Even though the front, you know, the handlebars are pretty far forward, and if you put a lot of weight on the bars, again, sometimes that happens because of the foot paying angle, and especially with new riders, they're not comfortable standing up. It can feel a little bit unstable, but that, that weight helps the bike kind of keep itself straight, yet it still feels light at that weight. Um, and that comes down to just the geometry they have built into it. It, has, it feels a lot lighter than that weight would tell you. It feels as light as it looks, and it does look pretty light. Um, some other things. So the brakes, man, the front brake on this bike is insanely strong. And so we're very happy that it does have ABS. And it has not only regular on-road ABS where it keeps the front and rear wheel from locking, you can set it and the setting will stay, which we love, in off-road ABS, which means that you can lock the rear wheel up and then the front still has ABS braking control. You can't turn that off. We actually found a way to do it by disconnecting a wheel sensor, the rear wheel sensor, and the computer doesn't like that, but that way we can disable ABS and traction control and it really so far hasn't caused too many faults other than a blinking flashing red uh, zone on the bottom of the, uh, on the dashboard. Speaking of the dashboard, it's pretty awesome. It looks exactly like the one on the 790. There's a couple less features in there, but it's pretty easy to start learning how to navigate. Our bike supposedly has Bluetooth. We can connect your phone or your headset to. Unfortunately, even though we tried to connect to it a bunch of times, we were never able to get it to connect. So we're investigating that, but it's in there. And I know other people that connected to theirs, so maybe there's something kind of wrong with our bike. Um, the seat is eh, medium comfortable. I guess it's not as bad as KTM seats have ever been. Uh, it's definitely not the best adventure seat we've uh, sat on. It has a almost four gallon gas tank, 3.9 or 3.8 gallons on their chart. And we were able to squeeze 3.9 into it when we ran it completely empty. Now, the funny thing is if you ride like a normal person and don't use that last 10 to 20% of the throttle, you will get incredible fuel mileage usually over 50 miles of the gallon. We saw up to 70, but when we really started twisting it, we got it down to 25. You know, when we're really screwing it on, riding it in the sand and stuff like that. So your mileage may vary. Um, interestingly enough, the fuel gauge doesn't seem to care about the last gallon of fuel in the tank. So when it says you are empty and you need to go to a gas station, you have zero miles. It's counting it down on the thing. You have zero miles you have almost a gallon left in that gas tank, which means maybe 50 miles of fuel range left. But uh, you know, be careful with that, but just realize when you fill it up, if you're only putting three gallons into it when it's empty, there's still 0.8 gallon hidden there inside of the tank. Um, and then we get into the build quality. So we've got almost a thousand miles on this bike. We haven't had anything fall off. We checked a few things. We definitely checked the torque of the engine uh, bolts. Uh, when we were changing tires, we checked a lot of the stuff around there. It seems like everything is kind of, yeah, I'm not gonna call it super high quality like you're used to on your normal Austrian built KTM. Stuff just seems a little bit off. When you look at some of the welds, they're a little bit different. The rivets that are holding the muffler are kind of, yeah, they don't look the best. There's some funny stickers on the bike that have things that say engine was tested and there's a, there's, couple other <laughs> lots of little labels on there so little tiny things that it seems like they've got most of the quality control st stuff down it's going to take thousands and thousands of miles to really find out what goes right and wrong with these the american bike comes with these crash bars which is probably a good thing for the intended rider the novice rider um, the european bike spec bikes don't come with that that adds a little weight maybe that's why our bike was scaling uh, quite a bit more than what the uh, manual was saying. But another good feature, 
Uh, the windscreen is slightly adjustable, comes up a little bit. There's a 12 volt outlet. There's enough stuff on this bike for $6,100, $6,200. You're doing pretty good. Um, and it's easy, the air filter is actually brilliant. It's real easy to pop the seat off with the key, um, six little Allen bolts and the, the air filter kind of clips in. We've been riding it in the dust, in the mud, in everything, and the filter is staying really clean, which uh, on a KTM adventure bike, that's been a point of concerns. So it may, might be one of KTM's best adventure bike um, parts. And I heard that was actually, that was designed in India. So um, overall, uh, that's your package as we see it. In conclusion, we're gonna bring in probably the biggest factor in this bike, the seat height. We probably should have talked about it in the handling department. And so it's 855 millimeters, it's 33.6 inches. That's probably with the spring preload collapsed because in this market, everybody, especially with new riders, is worried about seat height. I think that's garbage, I really do. I don't want you to worry about what the seat height is because you don't ride with your feet on the ground. But that being said, a lot of people will go to the dealer if they can't put both their feet down on the ground, they say, this bike isn't for me. I say, learn how to balance and you don't ride with your feet on the ground. Yet, if you sit at the front of this tank where it's nice and narrow at this part of the bike, it's not a problem to get your feet down on the ground. If you start sliding back, it gets a little bit wide. It may be a little bit more of an issue. But in doing that, in having that low seat height, it lets a rider feel comfortable. You know, they want to put their feet down, you know, when they come to a stop or when they don't feel comfortable riding off road. I kind of understand that. But they've done a really good job designing a bike with a low seat height that still does everything else it's supposed to do. And the reason I'm so harping on seat height is besides the price in this market, that's probably the second biggest factor in determining do I want one of these? Is this the right bike for me? I think that for a novice rider, a smaller rider, um, uh, you know, some of the, the female riders that just don't fit on the larger bikes, don't be intimidated by the number. 390 is plenty. It's gonna give you everything you need in that department. The suspension is as good as anything else you're gonna find on a bike that's this sized. And so I'm almost positive that the seat height was one of the determining factors about a lot of decisions that were made around this motorcycle. Well, there's always emissions and other things like that. This is a very important bike for KTM. And the reason is, is they're not known for entry level bikes. Their slogan is ready to race. I, I used to race for them when it was called fun in motion. That's more of what this bike is to me. It's, it's a really fun, easy to ride, uh, beginner, novice friendly, that's gonna, that's gonna give you the capability to do probably more adventuring than you want to. Most people really want to. It's gonna get you there. And it's it, the bike is robust enough, has skid plate, has crash bars. You put some good tires on it like we did, you're ready to go. So this is important to feed KTM, you know, new adventure riders, get people familiar with the brand. Maybe people that didn't start on a dirt bike as a kid, some of the stuff we're complaining about isn't gonna bother you at all because you're not used to the dirt bike things that we are. This is a little bit more like the Duke. In fact, that the chassis and stuff, since they're so similar, it matches that you know sort of philosophy. Just easy to ride, comfortable, all those kind of things. So KTM's really banking on this bike. That's why the price is so low. So they can kind of get you in there, get you on their brand, let you learn a lot about what they have to offer. You know, when you're sitting here looking at 790s and 1090s and other bikes for the future, this is the stepping stone. I think if there is a shortcoming and, and in my world, it's like, I'm always saying, oh, they could have done this more. They could have done that more. I know with this throttle control and with this computer here, that you could have you know, variable traction control, which would be an awesome addition. I think that maybe with a, a little bit of chassis tweaks, this bike could really you know, branch out and be a lot more well-rounded. In other words, maybe not good just for the novice and beginner rider, but something that you can grow with. And I think that's the limiting factor on this right now, is that maybe it doesn't have the growth potential that a lot of the other bikes, maybe since they start on the higher level, have. But, that being said, for the intended market, uh, KTM's really done a great job. And for the price, I don't know where you can beat this.